my name is Catherine Stoner. I'm a senior fellow here and a political scientist. Um, and I'm here in my capacity as um, the uh, Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law here at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, where you're sitting. Um, and I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our speaker, Alexandra uh, Matvichuk, this afternoon. And also telling you a little bit about the ST Lee lecture, which she will deliver. The SCT Lee lectureship is named for Seng T. Lee, a business executive and noted philanthropist who, who died on uh, July 29th, 2022, at the age of 99. Dr. Lee, the title is honorific because he received honorary doctorates from no less than four institutions. I think that might be more than Francis Fukuyama here in the front row, but I'm not sure. Um, he was, you're not saying, okay. <laughs> he was the director of the Lee Group of Companies, uh, which is a conglomerate that spanned industries from pineapple farms to financial investments in Singapore. And he also was the director of the Lee Foundation, which was founded in 1952 by his father, visionary businessman, Lee Kong Chan, who um, made his business in the rubber, pineapple, coconut oil, and sawmill trades. The Lee Foundation has grown to become one of Singapore's largest charitable organizations that supports education, healthcare, welfare, and disaster relief. So Dr. Sing, Lee Seng T, or by Western Convention, S.T. Lee, graduated in economics in 1950 from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And you might be wondering, so then why did he endow in a lectureship here at Stanford? Well, as director of the Lee Foundation, he followed his father's example and continued to support higher education at prestigious institutions throughout the world. This included Cambridge and Oxford, some universities in the United Kingdom, Harvard and Stanford here in the United States and other institutions throughout Asia, Australia, even in Alaska, South America, and South Africa. A bibliophile, Dr. Lee also supported libraries, reading rooms, and public lectures series like ours, believing that for disseminating information, these gifts tended to produce the most bang for the buck. Well, Chinese convention, as I said, is to display Family name first, Dr. Lee recognized the European Convention, and so his projects remain S.T. Lee's. At Stanford, um, the S.T. Lee lectures span topics in, and throughout the world, span topics in science, humanities, military history, public policy, government, and they provide a platform for scholars and policymakers to address critical international issues. Dr. Lee endowed the annual lectureship here at the Freeman Spogli Institute in order to raise public understanding of the complex policy issues facing the global community today and to increase support for informed international cooperation. The ST Lee Distinguished Lecturer following Dr. Lee's wishes is chosen for his or her international reputation as a leader in international political economic, social, and health issues, and strategic policy-making concerns. Past ST Lee Distinguished Lecturers at FSI, it's a lot of acronyms, have included uh, Dr. Emmanuel Gima Bodhi, co-founder of Afrobarometer, Ambassador Susan Rice, who is visiting with us here uh, at FSI this quarter, Ambassador Wendy Sherman, Professor Valley Nasser, John Prendergast, Robert Hormatz, and Professor Joseph Nye. So it's very fitting that we add our speaker today, Alexandra, or as we call her, Lesia Matvichuk, to this highly select group of distinguished ST Lee lecturers. Now, according to her official biography, and I did some web surfing um, to look around, Alexandra Matvichuk is often simply described as, quote, a human rights defender who works on human rights in Ukraine and the OSCE region, end quote. But she's rather... Uh, more than that. That's a bit of an understatement of who Alexandra is, what she does, and the difference she is making for Ukraine and the world. <clears throat> Lesia graduated from Tara Shevchenko National University with an LLM in 2007. And in 2017, here's the Stanford link, she became the first woman to participate in the Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program, 
which is now the Strengthening Ukrainian Democracy and Development Program here at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. And so we feel we have a claim to her as well. Now, Lesia has been committed to civil and human rights in Ukraine and internationally her whole professional life. She joined the Center for Civil Liberties, the organization that she now leads in Kyiv, right out of university in 2007. And it had only then just been established, um, and part of its mission was to press the Ukrainian government in the wake of the Orange Revolution that began in the autumn of 2004 and ended in the winter of 2005 to continue with democratic reforms, including improved public control and oversight of law enforcement agencies and the judiciary. By 2012, only five years later, Alexandra had become a member of the Advisory Council under the Commissioner for Human Rights of Ukraine's National Parliament, Verkhovna Rada. And after the violent crackdown of, on peaceful demonstrations called Euromaidan on Independence Square in Kyiv on November 30th, 2013, she coordinated the Euromaidan SOS project to provide legal assistance to the victims of the protests in Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities, as well as to collect and analyze information to protect protesters, provide interim assessments of the situation and monitor abuses committed against civilians by the security forces. Alexandra has since then run multiple international mobilization campaigns for the release of prisoners of conscience, and now, unfortunately, in Ukraine, prisoners of war. With the ouster of the corrupt former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, the Euromaidan protests became what is now commonly known as Ukraine's revolution of dignity. In the eight years between that popular revolt against kleptocracy and growing autocratic governance, the Russian illegal seizure of the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine in March of that year, and the full invasion of Ukraine by Russia that began on February 24th, 2022, Alexander has remained singularly focused on the difficult but vitally important work of documenting war crimes and ongoing uh, occupation of the Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson regions of Ukraine, in addition to Crimea. Among many other activities, Lesia and the Center for Civil Liberties, together with other partners, created the Tribunal for Putin initiative in March of 2022 in order to document international crimes under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in all regions of Ukraine, which became the targets of the attacks of the Russian Federation. The Tribunal for, Initi for Putin initiative has a database of close to 70,000 documented cases of war crimes as of today. For her unwavering commitment to her work, Lesia has received international recognition, including the Democracy Defender Award for her, quote, singular contribution to promoting democracy and human rights from missions to the OSCE, the Right Lively Award, an international award to honor and support those offering practical and exemplary answers to the most urgent challenges facing us today in 2022, and that same year was also recognized as one of the 24, 25 most influential women in the world by the Financial Times. And incidentally, in the same year, 2022, in an otherwise terrible year for Ukrainians in the world, the Center for Civil Liberties, which Alexandra leads, as I mentioned, was the first Ukrainian organization to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. So we are honored and so very proud to warmly welcome back to CDDRL and Stanford today, uh, Alexandra Matvichuk as our ST Lee lecturer for 2024. It's a great pleasure for me to return to Stanford. I spent one beautiful year here and I call this year an intellectual luxury. So I'm extremely grateful for inviting me and to provide this opportunity to address to this distinguished audience. My lecture is about security, which people in developed democracies have started to take for granted. Nevertheless, the world is very interconnected. It is impossible to build a paradise even on single island if the part of the world is bleeding, if we want to have freedom, 
and to live in security, we have to fight for them globally. I have often heard that freedom, human rights are important, of course, but economic benefits, geopolitical interests, and security concerns are even more significant. And that is why developed democracies compromised with authoritarian regimes. They use their cheap labor and natural resources and thus help to strengthen authoritarianism. But peace and human rights are inextricably linked. States that grossly violate human rights by prosecuting journalists, jail activists, and dispersing peaceful demonstrators pose a threat not only to their own citizens, but also to security and peace in general. When politicians make decisions based solely on party, economic, security, or geopolitical interests and reject the values of freedom and human rights, then even if they benefit in the newer future, we are going to face a real disaster in the long-term perspective. One clear example is Russia, which destroyed its own civil society step by step. But for a long time, the developed democracies turned a blind eye to this. They continued to shake hands with Russian leadership, building gas pipelines and carrying on business as usual. For decades, Russian troops committed crimes in multiple countries, but there were no consequences. The world scarily blinked at the annexation of Crimea by military force, which was unprecedented in post-war Europe. And Russia believed that it can do whatever it want. And now, as a human rights lawyer, I found myself in a situation when the law doesn't work. Russian troops are destroying residential buildings, schools, churches, museums, and hospitals. They're attacking evacuation corridors. They're torturing people in filtration camps. They forcibly taking Ukrainian children to Russia. They ban Ukrainian language and culture. They're abducting, robbing, raping, and killing civilians in the occupied territories. The entire UN architecture of international organizations and treaties can't stop this. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, we have faced an unprecedented number of war crimes. We have joined our efforts with dozens of organizations in the regions and built a national network of documentators throughout the country, including their occupied territories. We have an ambitious goal to document every criminal episode that has been committed in the smallest settlement in each oblast in Ukraine. Working together, we have already recorded and contributed over 68,000 episodes of war crimes to our database. We are documenting more than just violations of the Geneva and Hague conventions. We are documenting human pain. This is a story of 10-year-old boy Ilya Matvienko from Mariupol. Russian troops surrounded the city and didn't allow the International Committee of Red Cross to evacuate civilians and open the Green Corridor. Hence, Ilya and his mother, like other people in Mariupol, hid in the basement of their house from the Russian shelling. Like many people in the city, they melted snow to have water and made fires to cook at least some food. But when the supplies ran out, they were forced to go out and suddenly they appeared in the center of Russian shelling. Ilya's mother was hit in the head and the boy's leg was torn. With the last trance, his mother dragged her son to a friend apartment. There was no medical assistance. 
Prior to this, Russians deliberately destroy maternity hospital and the entire medical infrastructure in the city. That is why in the apartment, they lay down on the couch and just hugging each other. They will, they were lying like this for several hours. And this little boy told to my colleague that his mother died and got frozen right in his arms. I have one question. How we people who live in 21st century will defend a human beings, their lives, their freedom, and their human dignity? Can we rely on the law or does just brutal force matter? The answer to this question is important not just for people in Ukraine, in Syria, in Myanmar, in Sudan, in Nicaragua or Afghanistan. The answer to this question will define our common future. We must revise our approach to global security and to respond to the challenges of today's world. Global security starts from human security. First, freedom and democracy must be protected. I live in Kyiv. And my native city, like thousands of other Ukrainian cities, are constantly being shelled not just by Russian rockets, but also Iranian drones. China helped Russia to secure sanctions and import technologies critical to warfare. North Korea provided Russia with more than a million artillery shells. Syria boats for Russia in the UN General Assembly. We are dealing with the formation of the entire authoritarian bloc. They all feature a crucial commonality. All these regimes have the same idea of what a human being is. Authoritarian leaders consider people as objects of control and deny them rights and freedoms. Democracies consider people their rights and freedoms to be the highest value. And there is no way to negotiate this because only existence of free world always threaten dictatorships with the loss of power. If authoritarian regimes support each other, democracies definitely should demonstrate unity in defending their values. Half of the population in the world this year will go to election. But don't be in illusion. More than 80% of people around the world live in not free or partially free societies. This means that people who have the right to vote for whom they want to vote, have a right to say what they want to say, have a right to love whatever their hearts them tell them to love, and freely choose what God they want to pray a minority. The problem is not only that the space of freedom in authoritarian countries is shrinking to the size of the prison cell. The problem is that even in well-developed democracies, the political forces who start put on the question the universal declaration of human rights are gain weight. There are reasons for this. The common generations replace those ones that survived the Second World War. They have inherited democracy from their parents. So they began to take rights and freedoms for granted. They have become consumers of the values. They understand freedom as choosing cheeses in the supermarket. Therefore, they are ready to exchange freedom for economic benefits, promises of security, or personal comfort. Yet the truth is that freedom is very fragile. We can't attain human rights once and forever. We must defend our values. It is the determination to act which defines the society which has a future. 
Second, unpunish evil growth. When you know history, it is difficult to remain an idealist. The 20th century brought two devastating world wars, terrible colonial wars, millions of deaths and the dehumanization of humankind, which reached its most concrete form in the Holocaust and Nazi concentration camps. The horrific lessons of the past demanded decisive actions. Responsibility for what had been perpetrator was codified in the slogan, never again. Governments created the United Nations system and signed international agreements. The idea that every person is free and equal in dignity and rights came to characterize the new post-war humanism. But evil cannot be vanished once and for all. Every day we make a choice. Democracy, the rule of law and human rights were realized in practice in only in part of the world. Meanwhile, the totalitarian Soviet gulag was never condemned or punished. There has been no responsibility. And that is why in Russia, the end of the Second World War is celebrated with a slogan, we can repeat. Thus, evil keeps coming back. The destruction of Grozny, a city of a half of a million people, the Russian bombardment of Aleppo, the firebombing of Mariupol, and the bodies of people killed on the streets of Bucha. Unpunished evil grows. Russian military committed terrible crimes in Chechnya, Moldova, Georgia, Mali, Syria, Libya, other countries of the world. They have never been punished. They believe they can do whatever they want. I talked to hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity. They told me how they were beaten, raped, smashed into wooden boxes, electrically shocked through their genitalia, and their fingers were cut, their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled. They were compelled to write something with their own blood. One woman told me how her eye was dug out with a spoon. There is no legitimate reason for doing this. There is also no military necessity in it. Russians did these horrific things only because they could. If we want to prevent wars in the future, we have to punish the states and their leaders who start such wars in present. Because all atrocities which we are documenting stem from their leadership decision to start the war. But in the whole history of humankind, we have only one precedent of punishment for the crime of aggression. It was Nuremberg trials. And we still look to the world through the lens of the Nuremberg trials, where Nazi war criminals were tried only after Nazi regime had collapsed. But we are living in the new century. Justice shouldn't depend on how and when the war will end. We cannot wait. We must establish a special tribunal on aggression now and hold Putin, Lukashenko, and other were criminals accountable. War turned people into numbers because the scale of war crimes grows so fast that it becomes impossible to recognize all the stories. But I will tell you one. The story of Svetlana, who lost her entire family when Russian missile hit her building. I heard them dying. My husband was breathing heavily, straining as if he was trying to throw the rubble off of himself, but he couldn't. At some point, he just went still. My grandmother and Zhenya died instantly. I heard my daughter crying. Then she also went quiet. As for my son, my mother told me that he called for me several times, and then nothing. People are not numbers. We must ensure justice for all people affected by this war, regardless who they are, 
their social position, the types of crime they endured, and whether or not media or international organizations are interested in their case. We must return people their names because the life of each person matters. Third, democracies must win wars. This war started not in February 2022, but in February 2014, when the authoritarian regime in Ukraine fell due to the revolution of dignity. And people in Ukraine got its chance for their democratic transformation. And to stop Ukraine's progress towards genuine democracy, Russia invaded. Russia occupied Crimea, part of Lugansk and Donetsk regions, in 2014, and then in 2022, Russia expanded this war into a full-scale invasion. Because Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom. People in Ukraine want peace much more than anyone else. But peace doesn't come when the country which was invaded stopped fighting. That's not peace. That's occupation. And occupation is just another form of the war. Occupation is not about changing one state flag to another. Occupation means enforced disappearances, torture, rapes, denial of your identity, forcible adoption of your own children, filtration camps, and mass graves. Russia unleashed terror in the occupied territories to keep them under control. The Russian military exterminates local activists, mayors, public figures, journalists, volunteers, pastors, artists. People do not have any opportunity to protect their freedom, property, life, and their beloved ones. This photo is one of the unmarked graves in the forest near Izum. The murdered children writer Volodymyr Vakulenko was found in this grave under the number 319 after the liberation of these territories. Volodymyr Vakulenko wrote beautiful stories for children and the entire generation of Ukrainian children brought up of his daddy's book. During Russian occupation, he disappeared. I know his family. His family hoped to the last that Volodymyr survived, but like thousands of other Ukrainian civilians are in Russian captivity. It's very difficult for them to accept the result of identification. Just a month ago, the Russians tortured to death Father Stepan Padalchak from an occupied village in Kherson. They abducted a 59-year-old pastor from his home and took him away, barefooted, with a bag over his head, having turned his home upside down. After two days, the Russian said to his wife that Father Stepan died. Before his illegal arrest, they several times tried to force him to transfer his new built church and its congregation into the Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate. But Pastor Stepan had refused, insisting that he wouldn't betray his oath nor his congregation. We can't leave our people alone for torture and death under Russian occupation. People's lives can't be a political compromise. Sustainable peace is the freedom to live without fear and to have a long-term perspective. Calls for Ukraine to stop defending itself and to satisfy Russia's imperial appetites are not just wrong. Such calls are immoral. Worse. A new international architecture of peace and security is required. I don't know how historians in the future will call this historical period, 
the world order based on the UN Charter and international law is collapsing before our eyes. The international peace and security system established after the Second World War provided unjustified indulgences for certain countries. It didn't cope well with global challenges before, but now it is stalling and reproducing ritualistic movements. The work of Security Council is paralyzed. We have entered a period of turbulence, and now fires will occur more and more often in different parts of the world because the international wiring is faulty and sparks are everywhere. Armies are talking now, and international law is not working. Nevertheless, I believe it is temporary. We have to start a fundamental reforms of the peace and security system. It must protect people from wars and arbitrariness of authoritarian regimes. Human rights and human security must be central to this new system. Why Russian invasion is a danger for the whole world? Because this is not just a war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. Russia uh, wants to convince the entire world that freedom, democracy, human rights, rule of law are fake values because they couldn't protect anyone in the war. Russia wants to convince that a state with a powerful military potential and nuclear weapons can break international order can dictate its rules to entire international community and even forcibly change internationally recognized borders. And if Russia succeeds, it will encourage other authoritarian leaders in different parts of the world to do the same. The international system of peace and security doesn't protect people anymore. This means that democratic governments will be forced to invest their money not in education, healthcare, culture, or business development, not in solving global problems like climate change or social inequality, but in weapons. We'll witness an increase in the number of nuclear states. The emergence of the robotic armies and new weapons of mass destructions. If Russia succeeds and this scenario comes true, we will find ourselves in a world which will be dangerous for everyone without any exception. The world needs the democratic success of Ukraine, but we approach to the second anniversary of the full-scale war in a critical situation. Russia spent 40% of their budget for military expenses, and this is only the official number, which is lower than the real one. At the same time, the supplementary package for Ukraine in the United States Congress is blocked. We are expecting a new massive Russian attack in coming months. And that is why Putin, in his interview to Tucker Carlson, repeated his genocidal claims that Ukrainians do not exist. He is confident that Ukrainians have to be either reeducated as Russians or killed. And that is why we have no other choice. If we stop fighting, there will be no us anymore. When Russia invaded, democratic countries said, let's help Ukraine not to fail. We must instead think about helping Ukraine to win. Because there is a significant difference between let's help Ukraine not to fail, and let's help Ukraine to win. This difference is measures in types of weapons, in speed of decision, and gravity of sanctions. Democracy has to win worse. If we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. And we have no time. The time for us converted in numerous deaths in battlefield, in numerous deaths in occupied territories, in numerous deaths in deep fear. 
thieves. People can make history. I have been working with the law for many years, and I know when you can't rely on the legal instruments, you can still rely on people. We are used to thinking in the categories of states and interstate organizations, but ordinary people have a much greater impact than they can even imagine. Immediately after the invasion, international organizations evacuated their personnel, but ordinary people remained. And it were ordinary people who helped to survive under artillery fire. It were ordinary people who took people out from the ruined cities. It were ordinary people who broke through the encirclement to provide humanitarian aid. And suddenly, it became obvious that ordinary people can do extraordinary things, that ordinary people who are fighting for their freedom and human dignity are stronger than the second army in the world. The ordinary people can change the history quicker than the UN intervention. I would never wish anyone to go through this experience. Nevertheless, these dramatic times provide us an opportunity to express the best in us, to be courageous, to fight for freedom, to take burden of responsibility, to make a difficult but right choices, and to help each other. When we help in each other, no more than ever, we keenly feel what does it mean to be a human. But I'm here to say that despite everything, the story of Ukraine is life affirming. Its dramatic times rise hope. When freedom is blocked, it starts to powerfully break out. And I want to highlight the fight of people for freedom and for human dignity in Ukraine, in Iran, in Myanmar, in Syria, in Belarus, in other countries of the world. We are paying the ultimate price just for a chance. Just for a chance to build a country where the rights of everybody are protected. Government is accountable. Judiciary is independent. And police do not beat students who are peacefully demonstrating. Because global security is first and foremost, it's human security. Yes, the future is unclear. But future is not for a return. And we still have a privilege to fight for future, which we want for us and for our children. Thank you. All right, um, we have some uh, time now, almost 40, 45 plus minutes um, for for questions and um, discussion. Um, and so if uh, you can just line up behind the microphone and um, start by identifying yourself and um, and then we can we can ask Lesia a few um, questions. Hi, excuse me, uh, can I speak in Ukrainian? With um, well, you have to translate it because not of all, our, all of our audience is Ukrainian. Uh, okay, so, uh, I, I'm just... Uh, I don't have a um, question. I have only, uh, I want to say thank you so much for your work. And can I uh, give you a gift? Oh, sure. <laughs> and not everyone has to give her a gift. <laughs> <laughs> it's not obligatory. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. На війні вона пішла добровольцем, і я дуже-дуже-дуже хотіла б вам передати. Дякую, дякую вам велике за все. Дякую.
I just explain what is a gift because it's very symbolical. This um, card is a picture of sister of this uh, woman and her sister volunteering and joined Ukraine armed forces. Now she in the battlefield. And probably you don't know, uh, in Ukraine, women are not obligatory to go to army, but 60,000 of Ukrainian women joined Ukraine armed forces and among them, your sister. Thank you for your service. So it's difficult to follow that up. I, I will give that to you. Um, so um, uh, are you moving your hand, Norman, would you? Okay, so so I'll ask you a question um, as people as people think. Um, Leslie, you showed us some obviously very disturbing photos and, and documenting almost 70,000 war crimes is, is obviously very difficult. And I know that you do some of that personally um and your organization does a lot of it how how do you um go on day to day not becoming consumed by sorrow um watching this it's not easy question because it's very difficult to live during the large-scale war it's difficult from personal and from professional point of view from personal um, mean that everything which we called normal life was ruined the possibility to go to work, uh, to meet with your friends in, with, in cafe, uh, to have family dinner, to hug your beloved ones, everything disappeared. Now we live in total uncertainty. We can't play not just our day, but next several hours, because you have no idea when the next Russian year attack started. We live in a constant fear for our beloved ones. Because if even we have no people from out the closest circle, uh, in the um, Ukrainian army, there is no safe place anymore where I can hide from the Russian rockets. So every morning in the street, I start with um, checking my messenger, what's happened but while I have a sleep in, uh, in, in New York, in Indiana, in Los Angeles, now here in Palo Alto. Uh, whether or not I have a home to return, um, do my family still alive? And from professional point of view, it's difficult because it's very, probably it's impossible to get used to some unbelievable scale of a human pain. Unbelievable. I, I still can't, um, can't get used to it. But there is two things which uh, keep me going. First, I do believe that our efforts have sense. And I know it's from our history because I decided to start my human rights work uh, being a child in a school when I got acquainted with Soviet dissidents. And I was so inspired by the example that I decided myself to study law in order to fight for freedom and for justice. And from short-term perspective, if you know something about a dissident movement, you can say that they failed because they were arrested, uh, they were imprisoned, part of them uh, were sent to forcible psychological treatment, part of them were killed, like their families were separated, career were ruined. But from the long-term perspective, we have a, a chance to restore our independence as a country only because they bravely fought against the whole totalitarian Soviet machine. So we are stand on their shoulders. So all efforts have sense. And second, as I mentioned during my speech, the example of ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things are inspirational. When you look to these people in different places who, who express the best kind of humanity, you tell to yourself, if they can, you can also manage. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll start on this side of the room and then move over. Thank, thank you. you, that was very moving and inspiring. Thank can you, you for your introduce work. yourself. Oh, my name is Heather Hudson. Um, I'm a professor of communication uh, policy and research in 
uh, a Stanford grad alum. Um, so I would just have a question for you and, and hoping to get some discussion from the room as well. Um, as you know, this is a very difficult and distracting time in, in terms of U.S. foreign policy. Not only do we have politi politicians of various views who are not acting as you suggested, but we're quite distracted, I think, now by some of the atrocities in the Middle East and forgetting about Ukraine or not thinking as much about Ukraine. So what would you like Americans to do or try to do to help to refocus or whatever you think would be most useful? And I know we have a former ambassador here and we may have others who perhaps have some thoughts later on what else can be done to refocus constructively on, on Ukraine. It's not an easy question to answer, and thank you for this uh, question. Uh, for sure, uh, unfortunately, uh, this war which Russia started against Ukraine, this is not uh, only one tragedy which is going on now in the world, and people are suffering in different parts of the globe. And um, I think that approach to refocus is not a good approach. We have to finish our job. Because conflict in the Middle East started not in 7th of October last year. This is the price of unsolving problem. The same with Russia. There is a good Russian proverb, appetite grows during the lunch. So, because West failed test to react properly when Russia invaded to Ukraine in 2014, when Russia invaded to Georgia in 2008, now we have this horrible situation. This is a logic. So we have not just refocus. I think it's not a proprietary approach. We have to focus and complete our job to make it done, to punish evil, not to let evil grow. And um, in this um, regard, I think it's, um, it's not uh, good uh, to compete with each other for attention because we all failed. Um, we have to unite efforts. I tell you the story of myself. Uh, when large scale war started, I got a letter from Syrian human rights defenders. And you know that war in Syria is going on for years. It's a horrible war. And still not, and, and they are not on the front page of uh, new media and uh, newspaper. But people are dying, people are suffering, people are torturing just in this right moment while we're sitting here in Syria. So what they did wrote, write to me, they wrote, we are with you. We know what war is about. We know what is human pain is about. Please tell us, what do you need to succeed in your fight for justice? We'll do everything which we can because your success will be our success. We have to finish job, to fight with authoritarianism, to fight with impunity, and it will have impact to other parts of the globe as well. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> to my wife and me and actually our daughter, you and your husband have been heroes for many years. Mm. Um, so I'd be shocked and very grateful to see that you were here. Uh, she would be here as well, but she's a, a doctor at the hospital performing surgery. Um, Congress about two or three, two, three years ago, requested a report to be done by academics. I'm at the GSB, Stanford Graduate School of Business. They requested a report to be done by academics to explain what should be the future of American atomic policy, military atomic policy? And basically the takeaway of the very long document was Russia and China are military powers, and it's going to be very difficult to really do anything other than support from behind because we do not want direct conflict with China or Russia. Um, this past Friday, the, the former, Belarusian, uh, former Belarusian diplomat 
to the United States was here. He's now been exiled from Belarus and lives in London, but he was here speaking. And, um, I got to meet with him, which was wonderful. And basically, <clears throat> and I'll get to the question here. His suggestion was just sanction Belarus. I mean, but Belarus is tiny. Russia is not tiny. Like it, we, we can't really sanction. I mean, we can, we do, but it's just not as effective as a small nation like Belarus. I mean, I guess, what do you suggest? You specifically mentioned it was only after the Nazi regime fell that we had Nuremberg. We can't have a Nuremberg until the Nazi regime falls. Like, what exactly would you suggest we do regarding Russia, other than provide weapons and military aid? Is there anything we can do regarding Russia itself now? Oh, thank you for this question. I will answer uh, about sanctions, but previously I want to emphasize that I think that our task is not just to repeat Nuremberg trial. We have to go further. It's a historical responsibility of people in 21st century. Make justice independent from the politics. Because what's the message we send uh, if we still look to the world through the lens of the Nuremberg trial? So if you will succeed, you will get justice. If you will lose, you will get impunity. I have a question for what we developed the whole international UN system of pin security and signed this billions and billions of international treaties. It's wrong logic because if we want to prevent wars in the future, we have to show the clear example that doesn't matter will you win this war or will you lose this war? If you start this aggressive war, regardless of the result of the war, you will be punished. This is important. And we still in this old logic from the past century, this means that problem not in law, problem in our way of thinking. Return to your question about sanctions. Sanctions is effective mechanism. And here we have a person who know everything about <laughs> sanctions against Russia, uh, but I will love myself also to say something on this topic. Um, we failed to close back door, which Russia used to bypass the sanctions. And this lead to very concrete results. When we examine drones and planes uh, which uh, crashed in the battlefield, we find in these drones and planes elements from United States, from Germany, from France, from Italy. They still find a way how to make trade with Russia. And um, we have so less precedent when companies or officials were punished for such behavior. This is a problem. So problem is not that sanction is not effective against Russia. The problem is that we not doing much to make the sanction effective. I name the sanctions which was uh, in, introduced against Russia after occupation of Crimea. Um, I call them vaccine because it was so weak that they help Russians to understand how to use uh, the global market in order to avoid sanctions. So these weak sanctions, like vaccine, prepared Russian economy to the full-scale uh, war. And why is it so important to close this back door? This is something which people in the West don't understand when they compared um, the Russian war against Ukraine and the Soviet war against Afghanistan. They sometimes journalists ask me, but a Russian lost uh, the uh, Russian citizens in several times more in this Russian war against Ukraine in comparison with 10 year war uh, of uh, Soviet in Afghanistan. What's going on? And I explained that when um, Soviet Union invaded to Afghanistan, families received coffins. When Russia invaded Ukraine, families received money, huge money. Mm -hmm. 
uh, our Russian human rights colleagues told that when people from depressive region joined Russian army, they started to earn money which they can't even dream in this region. Even more, if this person will be killed in the war, his family received money which this person will never earn if, even if this person will work until the end of his life. And my Russian human rights colleague called this type of economy necronomy. And we have to cut this possibility be to have this frozen effect of Russian economy to face this war. Yeah, unfortunately, the economy is growing, but it's, I mean, the sanctions have hurt their economy, but, but clearly not enough. Um, yes, over here. Um, thank you. My name is Svetlana Khutka. Uh, I was a Fulbright scholar at Stanford, Ukrainian Fulbright scholar, and uh, I'm honored that I'm also one of Ukrainian scholars as Alexandra, who have been here and had the opportunity uh, to talk the very first at Stanford course about Ukraine in 2015, uh, thankfully to the great endorsement by the professor Norman Neumark. From 2015 till now, uh, Stanford uh, had and has maybe the best collection of experts who are speaking about Ukraine and talking about Ukraine. Uh, I recently founded an independent nonprofit, which is Ukrainian American Research Institute. Uh, and yet my question is uh, to uh, Stanford, what are the chances that here at this very respectful community where so many professors have been so many times on the ground in Ukraine for years, uh, we have chances that the um, Ukrainian Studies Center will be founded here, not under the umbrella of Russian studies, but as the, um, the one which is focused on Ukraine as the this you know focal point, geopolitical point uh, of the region. Um, so this is my question. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. I, I can take a stab at it, I guess, but I'm looking around to my colleagues desperately. We have plans um, to do that. Uh, we just don't have money to fulfill the plans. Um, Stanford is very, very decentralized, so we can't. We have we have to, you know, find donors. We have very mixed feelings about ever taking money right now, especially in the war effort out of Ukraine, to a wealthy place like this. Um, but if we can find donors here, I suppose in the United States, many of us would feel very comfortable doing that. Um, the university has very, a lot of competing priorities, and this is not a good answer. Uh, it's an explanation, I suppose. I don't, and I don't mean for it to sound like an excuse, although I realize it does. But we have our, we still have our, um, our um, strengthening Ukrainian uh, uh, democracy and development program. Um, we, you know, have Ukrainian students. We we do a lot of activities to support Ukraine. We have uh, Michael leads a, a group on sanctions. Um, so it's really sort of a matter of, of having, you know, programming and perhaps uh, Leslie had a very good idea of having an annual conference on modern Ukraine. Um, one thing I, I know we're not anxious to do at CDGRL, and I won't speak for my colleagues, but they can speak up for themselves, um, is, is to permanently bring Ukrainian academics out of Ukraine, um, because that contributes to a brain drain that Ukraine needs uh, to, in, in order to rebuild itself. So. You know, we have upped our activity. Um, I, uh, we don't control what crease is called, for example, um, but, um, but you know, it's a matter of finding the, the right set of donors to be able to do that is the, Thank you. the best answer. Yep. Thank you very much. It's uh, inspiring, depressing, but inspiring. I, uh, by the way, I'm Casey Leadham. Uh, Palo Alto resident. Uh, I'm inspired in particular about your focus on human rights first, you know, states' rights second, that foreign policy and national policy should be driven by human rights. So I'm going to ask kind of a difficult question. Uh, someday this war will end. Mm -hmm. And in the end, there's going to be Ukraine and there's going to be Russia and other states. How do you envision 
the future will look like when Ukrainians 10 years, five years, 50, I don't know how many years in the future were there. And there's their Russian neighbors, many of whom are their relatives, people he used to know, and also the people who fought against them and committed horrifying war you know, atrocities. How does healing happen? And how does you envision a future where, like Germany, you know, and maybe South Africa, we can look at that, the Truth and Reconciliation, reconciliation Conferences, how would you see the future happening where someday Ukrainians and Russians are friends again? Thank you for this question. Um, it's um, especially difficult to answer because we have no idea. Either we are in the end of the war, in the middle of the war, or just in the beginning of the war. So it's very difficult to visualize such possibility in future. But I will tell you uh, two um, sociological survey in Ukraine which related to this issue. First, it it was not sociology; it was more like a focus group, um, which was conducted by one Ukrainian um, psychologist, um, and uh, she asked um, people from whom do you do you expect um, excuse from the Russian side, um, from Putin, from Russian um, um, artists, uh, from Russian army, from Russian parliament, from Russian people in general, from some concrete person and institutions. And the vast majority of Ukrainians who participated in this focus group, they answered from nobody which means that Ukrainians not want excuse. They want something else. And what they what do they want? This is another survey which was conducted in um, autumn 2022. And Ukrainians were asked, what will be the main disappointment for you when the war will end? And the vast majority, 65% of people answered, the main disappointment for us will be impunity for Russian war crimes. So first, Ukrainian people need justice. And then, probably, we can visualize another types of the future. And this is important not just for people in Ukraine, but for Russia itself. Because look to this war. This is not just a war of one person. This is a war which supported by majority of Russian people, either who uh, strongly uh, support this war or just say that our oh, government know better what has to be done. And if he started this war, it will be a huge mistake to lose it. So this way of thinking. And um, Putin governed his country, not just with repressions and uh, censorship, but with a special social contract between Kremlin's elite and Russian people. And this social contract is uh, based on Russian glory. And the problem is that, unfortunately, majority of Russian people still see their glory in the forcible restoration of Russian empire. So that is why when I speak with my brave Russian human rights colleagues, with whom we work on a daily basis, because we have thousands and thousands of illegally detained civilians, um, Ukrainian citizens in Russia, in occupied territories. And for us, like the only way to identify where they are and to send something, to get some information, is uh, only uh, possible through the hands of our brave Russian colleagues who are tiny minority in Russia in especially vulnerable position because they against not just Putin's regime, but majority of uh, Russian people. And when I ask them, okay, how, how we can help you? Because human rights organization in Russia were closed. These people were labeled like foreign agent. Part of them left the country, part of them still there. Months ago, my friend and colleague, the Russian, um, the, the head of Russian Human Rights Center Memorial was jailed. He's 71 year old. And uh, when I ask them how we can help you, they always answer, if you want to help us, 
please be successful because only success of Ukraine and military defeat of Russia will provide a chance for democratic future of Russia itself. Not guarantee, there is no guarantee in our life, but at least a chance. Great, thank you. The gentleman uh, approaching the microphone on the right. So my name is Mike McFall. I'm the director of FSI and a professor here at Stanford. Uh, Leslie, it is such an honor for us to host you uh, here. Uh, all you had to do is just show up and say five words, and it would have been a great honor. But you made it even more special with just a, a truly fantastic talk. And I hope that we can publish that and, and get lots of people to read what you said here and watch the video of this. Um, I give a lot of talks about Ukraine here in my country, um, not just on the West Coast and the East Coast, but sometimes in places like Texas and Montana. Uh, to try to do what you're doing on your tour. I know you're not, you have a very uh, active speaking tour here, and I thank you for that because we need more Ukrainians to be doing things just like this here in, my, in the United States. And I'm going to ask you the hardest question I get asked every single time uh, because I end my talk with why you should do everything you can, and I say this to my American friends who are here, everything you can to put all the pressure you can on our House of Representatives to pass the aid bill to Ukraine. And I could... And every time I say that, I get a question from somebody standing in a microphone just like this. And they say, Professor McFall, if they're being nice, or just Mr. McFall, if they're not so kind, um, or they don't even tell me <laughs> that, not even that. Sometimes it's a little more hostile. And they go like this and they say, you don't know that we have our problems here in Montana. You don't know that we have our problems here in Texas. And why should we care about Ukraine? And more important, this is the hardest part of it. I can answer that part. I can answer it in a big abstract way. And I know you're not a general and I'm not a general. So I wanna, I wanna put that in parentheses. But the really hard question is they say, what, what will change Professor McFall and in a year from now, after we give our $50 billion, tell me how that will change the situation on the ground in Ukraine to a, a more favorable outcome for the Ukrainian people. So how, how do you answer that question to the American people? I am grateful, Professor Mike Paul, for... <laughs> <laughs> With a huge respect. Um, not just for the question, but for, for your enormous efforts to support uh, Ukraine. And I will use this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to people in the United States of America for your solidarity with Ukrainian people in this dramatic time of our history. Thank you. It's so important not to be alone in a large-scale war. We'll never forget your support. We'll never forget your solidarity. And um, the question, the answer to the question, how it will change, is very simple. We will survive. Because when United States and other countries start to provide Ukraine with weapons, it give us a chance to push Russian troops out from the Kiev region to push Russian troops out from the Kharkiv region, to put Russian troops out from the Kherson region. And then we have a stop and we have to go to counteroffensive without any modern plane when Russia like bombarded Ukrainian sky with uh, planes and uh, air bombs. The situation has changed because in a war, when you have country with uh, which was 11th economy in the world which has a much greater military potential nuclear weapons and 150 millions of population there is two elements of victory it's bravery and i'm confident that ukraine show it and we will remain in the history like this but second is technology. We need modern weapons in order to save lives. And our partners have such modern weapons. 
And so how it will change situation? It will help me to survive. It will help my family to survive. I today lost my friend. That's why I'm so calm and emotion, emotional. If he got these weapons earlier, probably he will be alive. I don't know. But to return to your question, this question even broader because we have um, to, answer, to answer to the hearts and minds and probably to the hearts and can say that we have to support each other because we are human beings. And it sounds so naive in our corrupt politician world. Uh, I mean corrupt uh, with not with money, corrupt with values. Because it became so cynical. Cynical people start to say we are pragmatic. They are not pragmatic, they are cynical. And we have to uh, name the things what they are. But for pragmatic people, I also have an answer. Our problem can soon become your problem. If we not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. Now they discussed in the public uh, Russian TV show, who will be the next, Estonia or Poland? When Russia attacked NATO country, it will be your people in Europe dying and paying the highest price, which we just can imagine. And believe me, I personally would like to give everything which I have, but just to return my friend, just to not uh, stop paying this highest price with a human life. Thank you. I'm very sorry for that loss. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you both. And uh, thank you, Ms. Alexandra, for the powerful remarks and the stories you shared. Your effort in promoting sustainable peace is really remarkable. And uh, my name is Tian Wang Liu. I'm a president of a Harvard Women in Defense, Diplomacy and the Development. Our goal is to advance peace building at the world level by empowering leadership uh, in those three critical fields. The stories you share, the sufferings that the women experience are very whole, um, whole, uh, heartbreaking. And my question is, can you share some insights and examples on women's role in those conflicts, especially their leadership, what challenges they face and how can we um, like, um, how can we deal with all those obstacles and uh, together advance the peace building? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can't define uh, the role of women in this war in one sentence, because I know a lot of fantastic women in different fields of society. Ukrainian women joined Ukraine armed forces. Ukrainian women coordinate civil initiatives. Ukrainian women take important political decisions. Ukrainian women document war crimes. Ukrainian women are in the far front of this battle for freedom and for democracy, because bravery has no gender and with this gender perspective it's very visible the difference between russia and ukraine and for what we are fighting for because in ukraine like in other democracies a woman can perform any role she wants but in russia and so-called russian world a woman can perform only a signed role for her in family and society and this um relations became a basis for authoritarian regime because how people treat each other in society it's always a reflection of society's idea how power can treat their own people and in this way a person will become political and that is why in Norway men and women have equal rights in Afghanistan, women are prohibited to study in the school. And in Russia, domestic violence is decriminalized because once again, it's always just a projection what government do to its own people. So in this war with Russia, we Ukrainian women are fighting for our daughters. 
We want our daughters have never faced a situation that they have to prove someone that they are also human beings. And how you can help us, you can express your women's solidarity. You know better what you can do being on your place. It's not me who can to advise what people can do. You know, hundreds of hundreds of methods. But the truth is that we need your efforts. Like if women in the United States of America will wrote to the Congress, will call into the Congress and push Speaker Johnson to do his job because success of Ukraine, it's national interest of United States of America. Just put this bill on the vote. Yeah. These collective efforts can have a change in the situation. We, during the Revolution of Dignity, have this feeling sometimes of learned helplessness because you're fighting against the state machine which tried to, to kill you. <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> Uh, situation, frankly speaking. I know this because I was coordinator of Evromaidan SOS and every day hundreds and hundreds of people who were beaten, arrested, tortured, accused and fabricated criminal cases passed through our care. And uh, we were in a situation when the law doesn't work and it was so easy to say, but what we can do? We are ordinary people. We we are not government officials. We can't change the situation and stop fighting. But in order to overcome this learned helplessness, there were different tools. And one of them I liked the most, it was artist work. The group of artists made the series of banners. And on the one of banners, it was drop painted. And the title was, we are drop in the ocean, which means, yes, we are human beings. We are not God. We can't stop this war, but together we are ocean. We can do it. And even more, without my individual personal efforts, nothing will be stopped. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Russia is a terrorist state is given. Um, I'll start. I have a, like a weird question. It's I'm going to start from dark side and then try to come with a more positive spin. And I hope you can uh, answer the question. So um, as on a daily basis, Ukraine is paying for the freedom of pretty much all of us here and people in Ukraine with the lives of the bravest and the brightest. Just uh, a few hours ago, uh, Pavlo Petrychenko, one of the greatest people in Ukraine tragically lost his life fighting for in particular for us being here and being able to speak at this beautiful building in this free uh, and amazing country that has so much uh, potential to do good in the world and uh, we grateful to Pavlo for his uh, sacrifice I mean Petro I'm sorry uh, and uh, the question would be, in your conversation that you're having with the world leaders, with the, um, the people who shape uh, narratives around the globe, a lot of them often say we're for all good against all the bad until it comes to some action. In your personal experience, what have been some successful approaches of actually changing people's perspectives or their actions uh to actually support ukraine and to do more not just say hey we support ukraine but actually do something what approach do you found more um successful if for lack of a better word in this uh uphill fight of kicking people out of this cynical comfort zone of living in the relative peace and uh safety at the moment thank you Thank you for this question. I wish I know the answer. And uh, I can't uh, say that um, and like uh, use the term success or successful approach. Um, because I think um, we have problem with ethic and ethical leadership. Um, it's so obvious that Russia invaded Ukraine and this is a bad thing. It's so obvious that you have to support 
country which was invaded and stop Russia. Uh, it's ob obvious that um, taking into account the difference between Ukraine and Russian potential, if it, you don't help Ukrainian to resist, being neutral, it means that you help Russia to occupy Ukraine. So everything very clear. So I think the problem with this ethical leadership and uh, understanding of personal um, responsibility and because uh, people in United States um, I mean politicians, because you ask me about, as I understand, uh, people who take the decisions, uh, how to reach their hearts and minds. They have to support Ukraine not because they love Ukraine, not because they admire Ukrainians, but because this is the right thing to do. It doesn't matter it's Ukraine or not. This is the right thing to do, that's all. Not fighting, says excuses why you have not uh, go from the zone of comfort, especially taking into account that our world is very quick, is hyper complex and very integrated uh, and interconnected, mm -hmm. which means that only spread of freedom make our world safer. Very good answer. Thank you. Yes. You can uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah, I'm Dmitry Kushniruk, Consul General of Ukraine here in San Francisco. Uh, thank you, Alexander, for a wonderful speech uh, and uh, having opportunities myself to to speak about Ukraine and why U.S. has to support Ukraine a lot of times. I just realized I was doing it wrong all the time because you mm -hmm. do it in a very, very right way, very emotionally. And uh, but uh, seriously, uh, you, uh, by the way, you also can provide absolutely wonderful answers to questions, for example, which Mr. Fall asked which he is being asked many times, right? And you were able to provide a, quite an easy, easy answer to that, like we have to, it will help us survive. Like I'm, I will try to use it as well. And I will uh, also would like to ask one question, when I, which I'm being asked uh, at some kind of such a, speeches as well, is uh, like very popular uh, question is how the war will end, how you make sure that the war will not um, repeat again, right? And uh, I'm always saying that if we just freeze the conflict, it will not bring an end to the war in future, like it will be repeated. That's why the only, in our view, the only real guarantee for Ukraine, if we will be allowed to become a member of NATO. And uh, then, uh, then people sometimes ask me, okay, but you also say that uh, if Putin is not being stopped right now, he will go, he will continue, he will attack some countries like Poland, like maybe Baltic states, which are already members of NATO. So they tell me how Ukraine joining NATO will save you if you say that he can continue with the other countries as well. Uh, so help me with the idea how to answer those questions. <laughs> I'm not the, the smartest person in this room, for sure. But I will try, at least I will provide my own answer. I told during the speech that I interviewed hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity. And you know what? Some of them told me that Russian soldiers shared with them that when we occupied Ukraine, we will go with you to attack next country. So if Russia invaded uh, Estonia, will invade Estonia and Poland, it means that we in a huge problem. So there is no contradiction doesn't matter politicians don't believe this or not they are their countries are secure only while ukraine is resistant to russian aggression that is why if we don't be able to stop putin in ukraine he will go further and while we are resistant he can't go further and today I got up at um, uh, five o'clock because I participated in a NATO conference um, with uh, keynote speeches. It's, it's a weird world. I human rights lawyer and I have to participate in NATO mm -hmm. conference, but this is life. <laughs> to speaking about human rights and speaking about security and speaking about that 
we need to get invitation to NATO. And this is a way how to stop this war, not expand it. Because when Putin hears that Ukraine will be invited to NATO only when the war will end, it's encourage him to make this war forever. It's, it's a logic. And Ukraine will be not just beneficiary, but a huge contributor to NATO. And this is not just the words, we prove it in the battlefield. Our men and our women prove it on the battlefield. We make NATO stronger. And Russia um, always was proactive. Russia made something horrible like wars or occupation, then presented like fait accompli to international community and push international community to reckon with it. NATO has to take initiative. Yeah. We, we um, t like perceive our security for granted for too long. We have to start to take reality seriously and to work with this reality. Can I ask you what the response is, Lesia, when you say that to people at, at NATO? Do they cite the rules that you can't have an active conflict? Um, on your soil and join um, NATO? Unfortunately, I'm not here. That's why I don't know how what was the impact to the audience, right. because before me, it was president of Italy who was speaking, and then me, and then the panel started, but I switch off from the, from the uh, ear. Uh, but I, like, we are not naive. We know that there is... Um, a small chance that we got invitation to NATO in June in Washington this year, but from our Ukrainian spirit, we know that we have to fight to the last second, to the last second of this summit. So wish us success. All right, we have uh, 30 last seconds or uh, maybe even 90 um, for a very quick question and answer. Sorry, Slava Ukraine. Yeah, so I'm Ukrainian and I'm the first time in the US and somehow luckily I got here today. But the thing is not about that. You know, um, I met uh, a lot of people like uh, in the US. I had different conversations. Primarily my visit here is business visit, but of course we covered Ukrainian question, right? Because I'm from Ukraine. <laughs> and I see that people here are accepting they accepting that in a few years uh, the war will go further, that it will go to Europe, and it's kind of something that cannot be avoided. And it's probably a question mostly to you, like to Stanford, not to Alexandra, mm -hmm. because it's one of the biggest and uh, one of the brightest university in the world. So how do you think what we should do in order to somehow work with these narratives that it's not done yet, right? The future is not prescribed, like Alexandra mentioned. And what do you think we as Ukrainians should do more in order not to help our people to spread these narratives that there is no way we can win, for example, and that uh, the war will go further? Um, so I don't think, so unfortunately, okay, I'm not Stanford, let me just say, uh, unfortunately, my, and I study Russia and a little bit Ukraine uh, now, um, unfortunately, Americans are extremely insular, and I say this as a, as a Canadian American, um, because I immigrated here, um, um, and don't really think much about the world. Um, they think a lot about the United States. Um, and, and so um, I think that's part of what you're experiencing. Um, there's a tremendous lack of information, but more, uh, more importantly, a tremendous lack of curiosity um, about the world. Um, so, so I think that, that people are unaware um, unless it is above, as they say, above the fold of a newspaper, um, right? So, um, so this is a tremendous problem. I think people, uh, I'm guessing you're significantly younger than me, um, people your age, uh, 
accepted, you know, the, and, and it's true at Stanford outside of the social sciences are remarkably uncurious um, and, and outside of history. Okay, we have historians and language people here as well. They're remarkably uncurious at, at other parts of, of um, university about the world, right? They're, they, they only care about it if it affects the United States. And somehow we have to pry people out of that one of the many problems for Ukraine right now, and Leslie mentioned, you know, Mr. Johnson needs to do his job, is our political system here in the United States is, is tremendously problematic. Um, and, and so I think, especially this year, it's incredibly unfortunate for Ukraine. And it is exactly what Vladimir Putin was counting on, is uh, Americans are even more inwardly turned because our politics are so fractious. And it's extremely frustrating. Um, and you know, if if God forbid the election goes for for Ukraine's sake, to be honest, if for Trump and I, you know, be a Republican, be a Democrat, it doesn't really matter. This is just a clear statement of what his foreign policy has been. It's going to be very bad for Ukraine and for Europe, and also for, for you know, in my humble opinion, the United States. Um, but you know, there are millions of Americans who disagree or with me about the United States and who don't care about the rest of the world because they don't understand exactly what Leslie just said is how interconnected we are. So, I mean, I think the best thing to do is have wonderful speakers like this um, come and, and make this point again and again and that, uh, and, and that their fight is our fight. It is, it is an American set of values to want uh, freedom and it doesn't matter what political party you're in. Um, and so I, I want to thank Leslie and I want to thank Ukrainians who are, are fighting a battle that is is all of ours and, um, you know, encourage those of you who can to to uh, call your congressperson um, and call somebody else's congressperson, especially because California, we don't have as much of a problem as in other parts of the of the of, uh, the U.S. in terms of supporting Ukraine. Um, but I do think that actually will help and pressure a, a Congress that is very narrowly held by, uh, by a fringe part of the Republican Party right now. So, Lesia, thank you very much. Um, I think this was an incredible afternoon and you can tell by the number of people still in the room uh, at 535 on a, a lovely Monday afternoon, how, how moving and how important uh, what you had to say was. So thank you again. Thank you very much.